So, what is drug metabolism? If you think about when you take a drug, you expect the drug to have an effect on you. One of the things you'll probably have noticed, though, is you have to take the drug often more than once, uh, maybe on a daily basis. So why doesn't the effect of the drug after a single dose last forever? And that's because your body has a variety of ways of eliminating it. And one of those ways, uh, eliminating it from the body, and one of those ways is through metabolism. So drug metabolism, sorry, if you like, pharmacology is what the drug does to you, and drug metabolism is what you do to the drug in order to inactivate it and eliminate it. So as a field, drug metabolism probably goes back to the middle of the last century um, and was finally systemized as, as an area of study by a scientist called R.T. Williams, who actually worked at Imperial College, or St. Mary's as it was at the time. And he was the first man who brought all of the data that existed on how organisms deal with drugs, or, or as we now call them, xenobiotics, um, which is anything that isn't really a food that's artificial. Um, so that can be an industrial chemical as well as a drug. And we, we use the term drug metabolism as shorthand for xenobiotic metabolism. It's shorter and it's easier to say. So, um, And it's really the science of, of understanding um, the relationship between drug administration and its effects. So I want you to imagine that you have a headache and that you've just taken um, an aspirin or a paracetamol. Okay, now, the tablet that you've taken is in fact a very complex piece of technology because you swallow it, it goes into your stomach, and because it's designed to relieve pain quickly, it will dissolve very quickly. After a few minutes, the drug will begin to appear in your blood. Not yet at levels where it will cure the headache, but it's beginning to get, as the tablet dissolves in the stomach, and starts to move into your body, the concentrations of the drug in your blood will begin to rise. And at a certain point, they'll get to have an effect. And the headache will begin to go away, but the drug is still dissolved and still being absorbed, so the concentration will carry on going up until all the drug has been absorbed, and then it will begin to decline. And eventually, again, it will drop below the concentration in the blood where it has an effect, and it's time to take another tablet. And that's why if you take drugs like aspirin or paracetamol or ibuprofen, you'll see that it says take one or two tablets every four hours. Now, this isn't something that's been made up. There's a lot of careful science behind that. Um, now, what you have in the little fingergram that I showed you is the relationship between blood concentration and effect. So when the concentration is too low, there's no effect. Then there's a sweet spot where it actually does the business and you have the pharmacology. And then um, if you're foolish and have taken too much, it goes into the toxic area and you begin to get cell or organ damage. And then you fall back down again in concentration and are excreted. Now, that process is loosely described as absorption, um, distribution, because the reason it begins to go down initially is because the, there's no more drug coming into the blood, so it's distributing into the organs and places where it needs to go. Then, as your body begins to eliminate the drug from the body, it comes out of those organs uh, and into the urine or the bile and thence into the feces. Now, what you then have is what we call a pharmacokinetic profile. So, pharmacology and the kinetics of its elimination, pharmacokinetics, or PK. So if I say PK from now on, what I really mean is that the blood concentration data is driving what's going on. And what pharmacologists do is they try and establish a relationship between effect, pharmacodynamics, and pharmacokinetics. So that they can predict, you know, with this concentration in the blood, in any individual who's taking it, I'll cure the headache or whatever. So what happens in these decline phases? Where is the drug going? What's happening to it? Now, some drugs, and I wish I could think of one at the moment, say and many antibiotics are actually excreted largely unchanged. So they come in, and what the body does is they filter them out through the kidneys or the liver, and they come out in the urine um, unchanged. For other drugs, it's more difficult for the body to do that. Um, so the body will try and modify those drugs in such a way 
that it can excrete them and eliminate them. So, this is done by enzymes, generally in the liver. So I want you to imagine now that, that this, this is a drug molecule in the circulation. It goes into the liver and it falls into the active site of an enzyme called cytochrome P450. And the cytochrome P450 modifies it and sticks on a hydroxyl or an OH group. So now it's a molecule with an OH group on it. So the two things have happened here. Firstly, probably the drug has been inactivated to some extent. It's been chemically modified so that it no longer works so well. And secondly, it's been made more water soluble and that makes it more easy to excrete. We've also put a handle on it. And if this molecule bounces around for long enough in the liver, it will come across other enzymes who say, OK, there's a handle. And they will put another molecule on it, something like glucuronic acid, which is a glucose derivative, or sulfate. So we now have a molecule that is not only modified, but has a large group on it that completely inactivates it and makes it easy to excrete. So these molecules then disappear from the body. And the decline phase that we see is a mixture of excretion unchanged and metabolism. Now, if we take a drug like ibuprofen, a couple of things can happen. You can get both these hydroxylations and glucuronidations to the drug, and you get a drug mix a mixture of metabolites excreted. And, you know, this is what defines why you take the drug every several hours, because your body is actively eliminating it. In the case of drugs like paracetamol, um, it already has a phenol group on it. It already has this group. So the first thing that happens is glucuronidation. Anything that isn't glucuronidated is sulfated. And that's fine at normal therapeutic doses. When you begin to exceed the therapeutic dose, what then happens is that other enzymes begin to work because there's so much of the drug floating around in the liver. So, some of this paracetamol may fall into a cytochrome P450 again. Um, this is a different cytochrome P450. There's a large family of cytochromes, all of which, or many of which, have the ability to do drug metabolism. So, the one that paracetamol is metabolized to, is metabolized by, is called CYP2E1. This does something that you really don't want, because it forms a reactive metabolite, which then can go out and react with proteins and other things. So that unless this metabolism, this, this metabolite is deactivated by cellular glutathione, it can cause damage. And in extreme overdose, um, that metabolic step is also overwhelmed so that you do get cell damage. Um, okay, so that, that's quite important. The idea is that metabolism should make things inactive and safe. But frankly, you know, we're not talking about intelligence here. This is just chemistry that's going on in cells. And sometimes cells do things that you don't really want them to. So that's one of the reasons why you should always read what it says on the tin and follow the dosing schedule exactly. One of the things that is really nice if you're a patient is if you only have to take the tablet once a day. Well, that's great, but if the metabolism is too fast, then you may have to take the drug four times a day, which is inconvenient and you know, people often forget. Right? So, if we know where the sites of metabolism are on a molecule, we can modify the molecule and we can try and block those sites of metabolism so that we can increase the half-life. So instead of that profile, we get this profile. Now, of course, there's always a danger doing that, that we will get that profile and the drug never goes away, and that's a bad thing too. Really, what you want is 24-hour intervals for dosing. So we can use this knowledge to modify our structures. I mean, you know, drug discovery is not static. We don't just discover one molecule to uh, treat a disease. We try and find better ones. So we can use our knowledge to design better molecules. And better molecules are often safer and more efficacious. If you can design a molecule where the half-life, this biological half-life here in the body, is optimized, you can perhaps use lower doses. Obviously, one of the things that we're trying to do when we try and optimize the, the pharmacological properties of drugs through optimizing their metabolism is make things right for human beings.
right? That's quite difficult because you can't just take any old new molecule that you have no information on and stick it into a human being. Um, it's not only unethical, it's dangerous. So we need to be able to screen through large uh, libraries of molecules rapidly and reasonably predictively and get good quality metabolic information. And we do that now by using a whole range of in vitro technologies, cell-based technologies, um, things like hepatocytes, which are isolated liver cells, things like that, so that we can very quickly rank a series of molecules for their metabolic stability in a test tube, so that we can show that there's a correlation between what we see in vitro with in vivo, and move more confidently towards dosing human beings in the hope that we have a, a drug that will better fit the, the properties that we require. So what are the challenges for us? One of the things we've learned over the last 50 or so years is that drugs are metabolized by a range of these cytochrome P450s. Now the main one is cytochrome um, 3A4 in humans and that does about 40-50% of all drug metabolism. But there are other more minor um, cytochromes, one in particular CYP2D6 which is very variable in the human population. So some people have it and some people don't. And if your drug is metabolized largely by CYP2D6, that can be a problem because it means that two apparently similar individuals will get very different drug concentrations in their blood because one will metabolize it fast and the other will metabolize it slow. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to firstly engineer out of new drug molecules at any dependency on CYP2D6. And where you can't do that, to make sure that we screen patients first so that we can adjust the dose. So one of the things that we're trying to do in modern drug discovery is to screen out unhelpful properties like metabolism by these variable CYPs so that the drugs are metabolized in ways that we can predict properly and understand and will fit more to whole populations. It's sort of personalized medicine, but trying to take away the problems that you get if you're not the right person.